in simple terms navratri is nine nights and the culmination is dashahara which is the 10th night navratri per se if you look at it it is a very beautiful occasion and a time for a spiritual aspirant even if you look at from a personal journey of life these nine nights are very auspicious everything in our sanatan philosophy is done only for one basic purpose and that is self realization the way you get up in the morning the way we eat food the way we have to perform our birthdays and death ceremonies and everything has the undercurrent is self realization and god realization this process of evolution this process of inquiry actually is facilitated by the nature also mahashivratri navratri these are the times when you get a booster effort you know you put in one and then you get a booster and you are immediately you take like 100 steps right there so if we can focus on these occasions these nights these these uh, festivities in from that point of view then whatever we are doing it enhances our effort multiple times navaratri this nine nights is a very beautiful journey it aligns cosmically it aligns from astrological point of view everything gets aligned in such a way that if in these nine days and nights if a spiritual aspirant seriously and consciously works on themselves their evolution can take a really a multiple leaps you can grow let me start off by offering my most humble and prayerful salutations at the lotus feet of our beloved bhagwan shri satyasai baba this is a time you know i always felt in avatar's life i i keep telling this again and again there are few things which avatar did and there are many things he allowed you go to him and he says somi i want to celebrate ashadi welcome i want to celebrate chinese new year welcome so he was open to everything but what he wanted us to celebrate in particular that is unique and in that i find navratri and mahashivratri these are the two festivities which bhagwan himself celebrated and led it and he showed us and the world a very new way of celebrating them how to really look at these navratri how to look at these special occasions of life he has given us a new perspective as a sai community and especially as a sai student navratri holds a very special place in our hearts and especially in mine because this was the time when uh, bhagwan chose me and taught me how to be a speaker and uh, that year when he selected me to speak that was a fifth day of navratri that i was slotted to speak and my topic was love so it is a kind of very nostalgic and Uh, a beautiful emotion for me you know as a blessing of bhagwan i would say so we look at the first in you know one concept of explaining which bhagwan also has done it so beautifully he does it for us is first 3 days dedicated to saraswati so what is this saraswati that we are dedicating to see for anything you start in life knowledge is important it becomes the basis if you don't know what you are doing then you are like a blind man walking on the street you have no clue where you are going to so saraswati is that invocation of that in that enlightenment that knowledge that vision that oh lord let me know what we say asatoma sadgamaya let me know so that is a saraswati phenomena and in that you find the three days of studies 
awareness knowing about god knowing about things getting aware of yourself so let us realize it and then comes the period of lakshmi what is this once you know yourself then you have to know how to act how to live how to be in that state and that state of sustenance is lakshmi how do we sustain ourselves in that format in that mode of awareness that i have known now now let me live and after i have lived in that format i must realize and that is durga like somebody very beautifully questioned swami one student in our alumni gathering he questioned swami swami had a habit bhagwan had a very beautiful style that after every interactions every discourse he would uh, especially with the boys he would do that he would just uh, ask any questions and it you will not believe even if there are 4 500 boys bhagwan could just simply say questions and boys could get up from anywhere and shout a question at him and it is a very beautiful sight to watch that swami would answer any question from any sphere of life people get by boys could ask him from spiritual uh, questions of any confusion they could ask him a political question about their struggle in life they could ask him about family issues anything they could ask swami and he would respond and it is such a beautiful interactions in that i remember one boy asking swami very sweetly he said swami you said i am god and i believe it <laughs> look at the question swami you said i am god i believe it then why should i worry about consequences of action and uh, why should i worry about anything swami said yes now you know it but you haven't experienced it the moment you experience this truth you don't need to worry about anything right now you only know it it is theory you haven't experienced hence you need to do your sadhana you need to act so knowledge is very good living with the knowledge is better but realizing the knowledge is the key as long as we have not realized it hum agar jab tak uska you know anubhav nahi hua if we have not realized it till then the whole knowledge has not reached its essence its speak so the beauty is that yes babu you know it but you have not realized it experience chale the experience you have not hence you need to work and worry and not worry but be careful about your consequences see that is where we jump we try to you know sometimes over philosophize ourselves or or simplify our life and saying okay swami will take care what do you mean by that have we really dedicated ourselves that he should take care and why should he take care you know have we become that special humne kuch kiya hai kya we have done something extraordinary that god should say yes he is my child and i will look after him you know so that is the beauty of this so saraswati lakshmi and durga see this is how you can look at it another way which is a very beautiful i i find it very interesting perspective which i have uh, gathered is the journey of evolution if i may say so hamari apni growth a journey of life if you look at it this nav durga is so even if you take the same concept for ganesh chaturthi period every festival is like that it has that same kind of connotation and intent that you first these nine nights are very important so what do we do we want to install god we want to invoke and install god in our house in our life in our heart so the first day of this navaratri we invite god and god enters in our life as the most hidden and subtle cosmic awareness and that is why we call it shailaputri the daughter of mountain can you imagine the stone like they say no the consciousness is sleeping in stone 
it is not stone is not bereft of consciousness we think stone is dead no nothing is dead in this cosmos every atom is vibrating with divine so what is the difference between a stone and this human body which is vibrating so high it is that vibrational that frequency in which the cosmic consciousness is vibrating so where the cosmic consciousness is vibrating at the least in the most subtlest form that is shailaputri so that is why we first invoke the mother as shailaputri that let the consciousness the supreme consciousness come enter and i install you i invoke you and so she starts that as that so we have brought her in even if my learning my understanding may not be there but i have received her now from there when the consciousness is born even if in a subtlest way then not, that there is not no avoidance action has started so how should we act we have to perform penance we have to conduct in the all the best possible manner and that is the next form of mata which is brahmacharini now look at the cosmic consciousness is entered now it has to conduct and how it can blossom is only by brahmacharini so if all of us who have to take the path of spirituality it doesn't mean that you have to start getting bachelor and all that no it is a concept of brahmacharini that one who can contemplate on brahman all the time like it said hanuman hanuman ji was married but he is considered to be a perpetual brahmachari it's a contradiction for many who don't understand the philosophy properly but hanuman was so much engrossed in lord ram that he was always in ram that's why he said rome rome every hair strand of hanuman used to sing ram see this also was given by swami only this truth that he did not tear his chest see how they depict swami said some film fellow showed you if you tear any body you only get blood hanuman did not tear his body concept is rom rom me ram in every hair strand was singing ram so that is the story told by bhagwan that he plucked his hair and gave it to everybody and said listen and every hair was singing ram ram so it was not tearing his chest it was giving his hair strand so what is that that is the concept of brahmacharini brahmachari one who is constantly engaged in the contemplation of brahman so once you have installed him then let us spend from second day onwards constant integration of god cia so let us get involved and that state we invoke the energy as brahmacharini and that is why you will find them mostly in the white yes if i am not wrong they represent purity so you can read about it they give you that beautiful symbolism of how brahmacharini is shown that's why bhagwan gave us white he never gave us orange dress to wear because we are supposed to be brahmacharis not limited only to physical marriage or non marriage because we are supposed to be in constant integration integrated awareness of brahman that is why it is so brahmacharini is also in white so this is the beauty of that brahmacharini concept so now when you come into that penance exploring that knowledge then what happens then there is an effulgence from knowledge when you churn sundarta to niklegi that beauty which effulgence which comes out of the churning of knowledge is ma chandra ghanta chandra ghanta is representing of beauty and bravery because the effulgence which comes out of knowledge of penance is amazing that is mind boggling and that is what is referred to as mata chandra ghanta so we are representing we are invoking that presence which we pray that ma chandra ganta when you are 
when we invoke you, let us also evolve to enjoy that effulgence, that grace, that grandeur, which turns out of penance of what? Of that cosmic consciousness. So the more and more we churn, what comes out is effulgent Mata Chandraganta. And then comes the fourth. When this effulgent is spreading all around us, then it is obvious to find a kind of convergence. So then it becomes, it takes a shape. What they say, you know, Bhagwan also has very beautifully explained it. You know, when he created that uh, egg, you remember uh, Bhagwan? There's a very beautiful picture of Bhagwan with a golden egg. And he calls it Hiranyagarbha. I don't uh, like, I have seen it, Swami create and I've heard about it, but I understood it after many decades. <laughs> what that egg means, I, I conceptually understood many years later, decades later. I used to enjoy watching him. He in fact showed it and I was blessed. I folded my hand and it was very mechanical, but you know, couldn't comprehend that what is he showing? He has produced it, no doubt about it. It came out of him. It's a golden, beautiful, shining lingam. But what is this? I don't know. And I could not ask him. There was no opportunity to ask him at that moment. It was, I, had, I think we had become an alumni by then. But I couldn't comprehend. But I knew that it's something phenomenal. <laughs> it is something phenomenal. Swami said, if you have watched it, you are liberated. All that he said, and it was very phenomenal. Okay. But what is this Hiranyagarbha? Kabhi socha aapne? I don't know. Ye Hiranyagarbha hai kya? What is this which he created? And decades later, I was reading some Bhagavatam and I got this concept of Hiranyagarbha. And then I read Swami again and, and it made some sense to me. It seems that when the creation started, now, I'm not going to tell you the creation story here, but when the, supposedly the creation happened, it happened by, as Bhagwan said, a will that Mahat Tattva willed, or not even willed, it can be called a will also. It is basically a wish to love, to express himself. That expression of Mahat Tattva took a shape what we define as aham tattva, that I-ness, which is correlated with Narayan tattva. That Narayan is that I-ness of aham tattva, which is Brahman. From aham tattva, what manifested first were three gunas or three frequencies. The vibratory frequencies which came out were Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And then the permutation combination of it is this manifested world. Okay, I'm making the story a little short. Because you, you can't, I can't take you through the whole journey. Time is not and the context is not. So, when this whole cosmos came in picture, then the Lord was, they had to create further, right? So, there's Ines, that Narayan Tattva, also felt the desire of manifestation, that will, that will happen in Ines. That Ines manifested what we know as Brahma. So Brahma is the manifested will of Ines, Aham Tattva, which is a cosmic manifestation of Aham Tattva, uh, Mahat Tattva. So the cosmic thing gave I, I gave Brahma. Brahma was said, in as they explained to you in Purans, he said, okay, I have created this Brahma, all the creation is done. You can choose these elements and create the now creation of yours. Let the play continue and you become the creator now. So Brahma does not create anything. He is like a perfect scientist who takes all the elements in the nature and does the permutation combination. So where does he put that? Where is his laboratory? Where is his, the, where he puts all these? That he creates, as they say, his egg. 
That is why this whole cosmos is called Brahmand. Brahma's and anda, Brahma ka anda, Brahma's egg is this cosmos. In this egg of Brahma, so we are all in the egg of Brahma. Brahma created the egg. Egg me usne he put all these elements which were already created by the cosmic will. When God willed that Ines willed, the three manifestations, three gunas happened, and the whole creation happened. Then Brahma ji picked up all these elements and put it in his egg. <laughs> and in that egg, then the Ines enters as the life force. So embryo and the life force and the cosmos became alive. So this is a drama. Now this egg. Now can you imagine this cosmos which you are looking at? Billions of solar system, billions of Milky Way. Can you imagine how vast? Millions of black holes. All of this is in Brahma's egg. Now, now start comprehending. It will either it can blow your head or it has taken my sleepless nights for many many nights for me. Think of it like all these cosmic drama is in the egg of Brahma. And when Bhagwan created that Hiranya Garbha, he said that is that egg. <clears throat> he showed us that egg in which the whole cosmos is. So, can you imagine you and I are in that egg also? Like he brought the moon down and showed it to the boys that this is the moon. Now, people can scientific crazy minds can question it. Like, how could you see the moon? How could he pick it up in his hand? Now he showed us that egg of Brahma, in which Brahma created this universe. That egg is Hiranyagarbha, and that is the picture of Swami, which he shows like that and says, "Show it to anybody, and you will cure any disease." It's powerful because it has the frequency; it has the seed of the whole creation. So there is nothing beyond this. All this multitude that we are watching and which we can't even comprehend is all in that egg. And he showed us that Brahmand, that is Hiranyagarbha. That form when we meditate on, that is your Kusumanda, that is Mother Kusumanda. So Kushumanda is that cosmic form of mother, which carries that womb. Now, where that egg will sit, that egg has to sit somewhere, right? So the cosmic depiction goes that mother Kushumanda is that one who holds that egg in her. So that is our fourth form, Ma Kushumanda. Now she is holding this whole universe egg in her womb, and what comes out is the fifth day today. And there, what comes out is skanda. What is skand? We say skand mata. The fifth mother is the skand mata. Skand mata we understand as skanda is the name of Lord Kartikeya. That much we know, but what does the Sanskrit skand mean? It is vibration. It is pulsation. It is vibration. So from the womb, what comes out again is vibration. Purna mada, purna midam, purna the purna mada chate. So nothing else can come out. What can come out from the cosmic mother is the same cosmos. So again, what came comes out was skanda. That vibratory power, which was manifested in the form of Kartikeya Maharaj, who could hold the reins of senses, who could govern the world, who could lead the army of senses, that was Skanda. But that is the vibratory power of Mother, 
and hence the fifth form of mata skanda mata is worshipped so there is a vibration can't believe it it's such an powerful vibration now skanda there is a the mythological story if you take it it has a very beautiful depiction how that child was born by the will of shiva and parvati see there is again a will they are he is a manas putra shiva and then he is taken up to a different lokas where kritikas take care of him hence he becomes kartikeya so kritikas take care of lord and he becomes name is given kartikeya so the beauty is he skanda skanda is the vibration so whatever vibrations we are experiencing like omkar this cosmic vibration is nothing but skand that skand who gave birth where he is he nurtured who is nurturing it that is skand mata so that we get our fifth form of our mother that is skand mata now imagine now once you have given that birth to such an effulgent vibration effulgent being which we are supposed to be part of that now what happens to the next that evolution of mother now when this mother has given that now she adorns a very beautiful effulgent powerful grace because of the increase of this uh, should i say vibrations this whole skanda she is bestowed with the power of all the three gunas that is your three devas also so the culmination of the power of brahma vishnu and mahesh the culmination of trinity if you can squeeze them in one which is a further expansion of this cosmic mother that mother is worshiped as katyayini now that effulgent which was manifested so big she was born to a saint called katyayan hence the name katyayini so katyayan ek rishi the maharishi the unki putri ki tarah unka janm hua tha so katyayini but the katyayini represents the power of trinity so brahma vishnu mahesh the culmination of this beauty was this maha mata katyayini so when we worship katyayini we are worshiping that effulgence of mother which has risen from the stone and reached a pinnacle of that grace in which all the three devtas all the trinities have converged so that is the equivalent power of the mother so now mother has reached towards the mergence and equivalence of that so from either you take the shakti path or you take the shiva path mergence has to be there you can't escape they are not separate so these are two shades which have to merge so katyayani is that convergence point if i may if i may use the word pardon me if uh, you know if because of my english it if it may not convey that but that is the convergence so hence we worship the sixth night as ma katyayini that full effulgent form where the trinity merges and she is shown as the most powerful effulgent graceful fearless mother katyayini after there is a very beautiful you know a, a format which changes now imagine if this effulgent happens then there is i think a mental block for humans <laughs> i'll tell you why i'm sharing this because whenever i look at you know bhagwan has really defined things in a very different ways like you know there is a story of a joke also what is light they say absence of is what is darkness and you say absence of light is darkness right that's how it is defined and everybody knows about it that's how they look at it what is light what is darkness is absence of light the beauty is now look at how shiva is defined in life 
if you look at look at our scriptures how we define shiva we we connote shiva with tamas sattva rajas tamas in that tamas is shiva can you imagine the worst thing we give it to shiva if you have to think of any like you know least decorated person poor shiva meditating on the top of hill mountain shiva so if you look at that and i used to always confuse me shivaratri the darkest night is shiva so poor fella is always in the darkness he's what is this darkness that we are talking about have you ever thought it looks funny to me also but sometimes you think about it like what is this that why do we con- connote shiva with darkness because the more i contemplate on darkness i realize the light is only you know it's a very narrow look like suppose imagine the whole hall is dark and you have a flash flashlight wherever you put light you feel that is a portion which is alive but you forget that there is a huge amount of area which is in darkness so darkness is actually larger than light from our perspective please don't take it literally the darkness is actually larger than light because for our vision we are so narrow that whatever we see we think that is light but what we have not seen we think it is a darkness but truth is that that darkness is actually light and what we are seeing is darkness because we are blinded with a such a narrow vision that for us that becomes the view and others we neglect that's why swami used to very beautifully say he would put his hand palm forward and say what is this isme kya hai you know he will suddenly look at you and tell you hey kya hai and sometimes foolishly we will immediately look at his hand and say swami nothing you know obviously there is nothing here and he say hey pichiwada this nothing is everything and this everything is nothing and he would smile and walk off and we would also laugh like fools but it has taken me decades to understand that what he was slapping me was this that oh child what you're looking at and what you consider as everything is actually nothing and what you have not considered yet is actually everything so when we look at darkness imagine exploring the unexplored imagine how much we don't know that is why it is dark why do we call it a black hole because it's black <laughs> because we don't know what is inside the black hole so now they are putting binoculars and they are putting so many telescopes there and they see milky ways pass by so that small dot in the space which we think nothing has so much of life in it so this is the beauty of darkness so unfortunately because we could not comprehend the god imagine whatever we have comprehended about the cosmos is only that flashlight focused on a wall but rest of the wall is still dark so in whatever cosmos we are trying to put our zoom and say i we found some milky ways we found this galaxy that galaxy these are flashlights the truth is there is so much blackout still so our knowledge is like that light which is so limited narrow and small whereas when you look at the darkness so called darkness where the real knowledge is hidden we are still unaware of it once you get realization of that darkness you realize closer to the shiva tattva that is shiva tattva which is beyond the beyond which is beyond the visible which is beyond what is visible which is beyond the comprehension that shiva tattva when you look at from a mother's perspective that becomes kalaratri so that is the mother kalaratri our seventh form of mother that cosmic effulgence which is still 
away from us which we have still not explored which we have still can't even comprehend that mother which is beyond our comprehension we can't even comprehend even up to trigunas we comprehended at least our mind has gone till trigunas and we said okay mother we give you a name of katyayini now but beyond that we we failed i think so because it's so difficult we don't know what it is and that effulgent form which is beyond our comprehension we named it as kalaratri it is represented by the deep darkest night and this is also in a in a practicing practitioner's point of view this is also connoted with occultism tantra vidya ye sab wahi se nikalta hai so kalaratri is that concept that's why occultism is beyond the normal you know you try to go into the realm of unknown through your practices now that realm which we have not explored yet that is kalaratri so we manifest we pray to that mother as kalaratri now imagine from there the next jump now we have seen seven nights we have comprehended mother as non comprehensible we have seen the mother with unseen eyes and that we call it kalaratri mother is very compassionate the god is ever compassionate he again starts showing you his shades from a different way and that culmination which we realize once you inquire into all that you know the journey of growth we realize there is nothing like good bad right wrong see all these distinctions starts falling off once you reach a stage of surrender you will surrender once you understand katyayini and kalaratri once that comprehension overwhelms us there is nothing but shut up because what can you say what can you speak what can you see nothing so the life really becomes quiet in that quietness there is nothing but an expression of surrender that is sharanagati in that sharanagati when you look at the mother then you realize the effulgence the benevolence the mercy the the grace the love the magnanimity all that put together we worship that mother as maha gauri because now we are ostuck with that form now we are ostuck our our whole abilities have collapsed now we can't go further and hence it is surrender hence it is quietness hence it is just acceptance of the mother and in that effulgent acceptance of mother we worship her we invoke her presence as maha gauri in that uh, i i i am not uh, so convergent with the, that astrological formation but they will say that you know in eighth night as uh, sorry seventh night i told you it's darkest but then the moon crescents again and you have the sun and moon in the equal combination supposedly on the eighth day eighth night so the effect of the cosmic equation on a human is very neutralized at that moment see when moon is completely lost it is diminished that time your ability to control is higher when the moon is higher in like normal days when the moon is full moon our mind is very difficult to control chandrama manaso jataha chakshu suryo jayata so mana is having a direct correlation with chandrama so when the moon is higher our mind is fluctuating very heavily so when the moon comes down then our powering moon is ability to overpower moon is better but all this is struggle whether moon is overpowering you or we are overpowering moon it's a struggle going on but then this night eighth night is that when the sun and moon are equal 
there is no vagary there is no uh, like need to overpower anything it is a sense of sense of give up acceptance not give up i should say acceptance sense of surrender acceptance ki bas ab to tum hi ho ma so whatever because there is no good there is no bad there is no right there is no wrong it is just the mother an acceptance of mother takes this form of maha gauri so this is a form of worship at that night eighth night is when everything is so ready for us that one leap and we got it you know because we are ready there is nothing to do just accept it and be let her take us let the energy let the the shakti let the shiva take us wherever whatever and that is the surrendering mode which we should or kind of worship on the eighth night which is maha gauri and after that on the ninth night imagine when you have surrendered what do you expect back so that is the full glory you know it is like now child you have given up so let me show you who i am truly you know when arjuna fell down then only the lord had to show him the virat roop so then comes the full glory of the mother when all our struggles have fallen we have surrendered everything is calm and on the ninth night she rises as siddharatri siddhadatri 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 is siddha these are all uh, uh, you can say these are all attributes or powers which one can acquire you know like hanuman ji also he said you know asht siddh nav nidhi ke data asht siddhi there are eight siddhis that hanuman ji is able to bestow on us now who is the giver of the asht siddhi who can bestow so there can be many bestowers but from where the asht siddhi comes that is the cosmic power so that form from where the asht siddhis have originated is siddha siddhadatri that mother in the full effulgent form giving us the cosmic vision of her that cosmic form of mother we have seen the cosmic form of narayan not seen actually but we have un- we have known about it now the cosmic form of mother is siddhadatri in that cosmic form obviously she has the ability to bestow because she is the originator she is the mother of these energies she is the mother of these powers so she can give anything so this is the cosmic form in which we culminate we converge we merge we silent there is nothing after that so she has taken us from a journey where we saw the cosmic energy vibrating in a very subtle form in the stone as a shailaputri to the maximum effulgent form a cosmic mother siddhadatri this journey is culminated on the 10th day now what happens if you look at this a ritualistic outlook of this whole journey you invite you invoke the mother you go through this 10 7 9, 9 nights imagine expectation is that now we have merged with the siddhadatri we we were like a stone in which our consciousness was very small unaware un, 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 un nurtured and now in these nine nights of penance if done properly god only knows on the ninth night we are supposed to get one with the siddhadatri and that effulgence is the mergence and that mergence is celebrated on 10th day that is vijayadashmi so we celebrate our oneness with the mother on 10th night 10th day that now we have become one and that is why this visarjan also takes place now the formal visarjan of the form body like i have merged now i don't need this body 
so we give up the body at the end of our journey supposedly when our journey finishes we are supposed to give away this body similarly the installation of mata's form which we have done on the first night first day is visarjan karte hain we give away on the 10th day cuz now let the body go let the form go because i have become one with the mother and that is how we celebrate dashera and bhagwan has a unique style of bringing culture tradition and spiritual quest into one synergy originally i i had you know i come from a background which it has a spiritual basis but i never had that orientation to learn you know vedas or anything like that and on this day you find the lord himself sitting as a yagna purusha and all the ahutis the offerings by the priest are not put in the fire if you notice it it is given to him they offer it to him and he puts it in the fire and that time you should see the flames roaring high it's a sight i'm sure all of us who have witnessed that can never forget that divine sight and bhagwan is not sitting far from the fire if you are really with him close by you will see he is literally over the fire actually you know normally if you sit near the fire you get the heat and you back off but here he is standing right on top of it and whatever is offered to him he just puts it in the fire and it's a sight which you know i used to get mesmerized looking at it and for that reason i learned vedas when i was a student i was th- that was not a mandatory thing for everybody to learn and later on our principal habu sir made the whole school learn it and then bhagwan made the whole college learn it and then he put it in the you know forum that whole world should chant so basically he made it everybody to chant vedas but at our time of student it was not a mandatory thing it was a choice if you like it you can learn it so i had taken this vedas only for that selfish reason that i wanted to sit next to him during this navratri havan can you imagine that innocent desire of mine that i wanted to sit because it used to be so beautiful to watch him and he was so graceful obviously he was graceful all the time but at that time his his grandeur was something totally different out of the world and you could not even talk to him at that moment when he would really sit like yagya purusha himself and pour it and then he would stand up i am just trying to give you a visuals if all of you have seen him can visualize it how bhagwan would stand at the top of you know the havan kund and he would lift his hands like this and it will be filled with all the akshatra and it's a very beautiful sight to watch i used to wonder like when he did like that first time i said where did he pick up you know that's like kind of an immediate like how did it come at him because he didn't pick up from any basket or anything like that he just did like that and he starts pouring it into the fire and it was so awesome like what is happening here it is a sight to watch when the creator when the yagya purusha himself sits down accepting the offering making the offering and creating the offering what a divine convergence of the creator and the creation and that time we used to have a lot of this small small anecdotes in that akshatra when he used to create in that there were a lot of things and there were some pearls also so it had rice it had so many things but it used to also have pearls and the funny part is there is a humor in that some would even pour the pearls also inside that everything was going but some pearls would drop down and then they fall off in those days the kulvant hall was uh, sorry purunchand auditorium was not having that pit in the front it only had the steps so many times when somebody would uh, pour it like that and many of the pearls would just trickle down the steps and go down to the devotees and the ladies and the gents sitting in the front row would grab it obviously you know we all want to grab anything which comes from the lord so they would grab it and you won't believe it the funny part is <laughs> that after the havan function is over 
Swami would send the seva dal or his students and say, "Go to so and so house. She has taken two pearls. Go to that house. She has taken one. Go to that." So and then collect it back. And this is like a Saira ma'am. Swami has said, "Please give back that pearl." So like that, he would bring it back, and that was another sign of his divine, you know, manifestation divinity that he would show us that even in that. apparent chaos apparent like all this happening the avatar was in control and he knew exactly what was happening so that was a divine sight to watch this nine day event every day morning you go there quietly watch the hava homan happening and when bhagwan selected us for speeches the morning turned out to be blessing for us because he would call us separately in the green room behind the stage and uh, give us a lot of pep talk if i may use the term and teach us the nuances of public speaking and he would tell you the postures the different styles of uh, you know standing hand movements eyes voice modulation so it was a very divine side that's why i said this occasion is very nostalgic and very blessed for every sai devotee and sai student to watch avatar in action is beautiful at one side you can see the creator creation and manifestation and emergence everything happening right in that small frame and next to this effulgent fire a beautiful raging fire everything purifying right there so navaratri celebrated the union is celebrated now historically we will talk about it as it's a very powerful day trust me it's a i always look at it like you know there is a very formula there is a very powerful days and timing do you think ram could not have killed ravan before Do you know Dasharatha? Swami explains it so beautifully. It seems Ravan was playing pranks from long time back. So Ravan had once thought that he will attack Dasharatha and kill him so that he can never have a child. Dasharatha hears it in uh, Ayodhya, and he shoots an arrow from there only. He doesn't even go to Lanka. He shoots an arrow and he locks him up in the Lanka. So the whole Lanka is like barricaded by Dasharatha. Sitting in Ayodhya, can you imagine the power of Dasharath? He didn't even go. He didn't even carry his army. Nothing. He just shot one from Ayodhya itself. What kind of missile he must be having? God only knows. He didn't kill anybody, but he just locked him inside. He caged him, and ultimately Ravan had to say sorry, and then he took it back. So he had a withdrawal capacity also. Today, if you shoot a missile, you can't bring it back. but dasharath had a capacity he could shoot lock you up and then when you say sorry he bring it back his son was ram who on a physical level has shown higher powers than his father who could do things which his father also did not do on a physical level so he was more capable why do you think he waited for this moment everything has its own timing and everything has to be done at the right time it is not an 11th hour for god it is the hour for god we think 11th because we are desperate we want everything fast we have to eat hot and that is a problem with humans we don't have we don't enjoy the journey we get literally carried away by destinations we rush into our lives we destroy our enjoying beautiful life we want to chase life for what life is not to be chased it is to be enjoyed god has given us to play enjoy but we are chasing it we are running for what i don't know but he enjoys it that's why you will never find an avatar in a rush but he will accomplish what humans can't even comprehend but avatar you will never find him in rush mode swami did so much around us have you ever seen him like oh i'm 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 running he was always calm he was surprisingly calm sometimes disturbingly calm like you know everybody is waiting and he is like relaxed listening to bhajans and 
in his own mode and people will wonder like swami are you really real look at this we are dying here and you just come out and finish because for him it was on time he knew exactly when the time is so when dashera when we say ram killed ravan or hiranyaka shuku was killed at that day these are all same days in different eras different gods have done the same thing even if they have to conquer or overpower a negativity force these timings help you like shivratri you can meditate on god any night but why is shivratri special because it helps similarly if you have to conquer negativity from an external perspective these nights these days are conducive and helpful so when the lord does it he also sets a precedence for people that look if you want to do something good here is a time do it we just finished shrad what is shrad it's a consolidated period man offer it if you have messed up with your fathers and grandfathers fix it now <laughs> till it becomes kalps or dosh and you are stuck again <laughs> so do everything it's all very scientifically cleaned up for us if you follow the protocols of our sanatan philosophy life would become very easy and better and enjoyable and that is how we celebrate this navratri